You're joining me outside in sub-zero conditions. It's minus two degrees today in England and I'm stood next to Hyundai's entry-level Kona Electric. This is a car that has 180 miles of claimed range, but it is freezing outside. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to answer one serious question. Can you realistically live with an electric car of entry-level specification in weather like this? Ooh. As the entry-level Kona Electric, our car has a 39 kilowatt hour battery, which drives a 136 horsepower electric motor at the front. Claimed range is 180 miles, but key to the Hyundai's appeal over rivals like the Kia e-Niro and Volkswagen ID3 is this entry-level car's price. It costs from just £31,800, which, crucially, leaves it £200 under the government's £32,000 grant limit. That means, unlike the e-Niro and ID3, which start from over £32,000, you're given £1,500 of grant, effectively meaning this 39 kilowatt hour battery Kona Electric costs £30,300 in Britain. That's not bad at all. But arguably this car's biggest headache comes in the form of the MG ZS EV, which in about equivalent spec, under £32,000, you get a car with almost 100 miles more range. That's a lot of extra mileage. So where does that leave this Hyundai? Before we hit the road, let me just highlight how many Konas we have on Cinch, with petrol, hybrid and electric cars available. We even have Kona Electrics with the higher grade 64kWh battery, where they have 300 miles of claimed range and they're up for under £30,000. And of course, there are thousands more cars from all types of segments on there as well. So don't forget to check out cinch.co.uk when looking for your next car. So really, we have two questions to answer today. The first being whether this car can keep up with its rivals. And secondly, of course, whether you can use an EV with only 180 miles of claimed range, whether you can realistically use one of these cars daily or regularly in a winter in Britain. Well, let's crack on with that second question first because it's fresh in my mind. I did exactly what you would do if you were to say, go on the school run or commute to work today. I drove out here into Surrey from central London and it was minus three degrees. I had to clear the windscreen. I had to scrape ice off everything. Now, I got in the car and I pressed the heater button and I pressed the heated seat and the steering wheel on and immediately the range went down from about 172 miles to about 135 miles and I was like, oh, that is not great. I was clearing the windscreen and then when I got back in the car, it was hot. Everything was really hot and the seat was hot, my steering wheel was baking, it was lovely. And I turned everything off and I suddenly got my range back and it had only knocked off a mile. So it does show that when you are using those systems the estimated range comes down on this car but then it comes straight back up and that's not consistent on all models i have been in other cars before where you do have that range knock off and then when you click those systems off the range isn't there so as far as keeping warm is concerned yeah the car does the job pretty well and i haven't used up any more range than i would have expected i've still got 132 miles left and i've done about 35 miles on the road so the range is realistic and it seems to be very accurate i think this car is actually i would say it's a realist in terms of its range i wouldn't say it's an optimist or a pessimist uh, and i think that's good right we want it to be a realist while our 39 kilowatt hour kona did a decent enough job at keeping me toasty it would have done an even better job if it came with hyundai's optional heater pump an £875 extra. Instead of stealing heat from the battery to heat the cabin, thereby reducing the battery's efficiency and causing those dips in range I mentioned earlier, the heater pump takes air from the outside and warms it up, with negligible impacts on range, according to Hyundai. Talking of heating, our car doesn't have the Kona battery heater either, which does somewhat hamper its charging performance, as you'll see later in the video, but it also doesn't affect the way the car drives. I even exercised the power a little bit. This car is 136 horsepower, nothing particularly insane. It's driven at the front wheels. It doesn't feel ridiculously fast. It's certainly nippy, but I never felt like in those moments of exercising the motor that the range would just disappear. When I've driven 500 horsepower, 400 horsepower electric cars, if you put your foot down, you just watch the numbers go down the same way you would if you were driving an old fashioned V8 engine. You put your foot down and that fuel needle goes down. This didn't do that, or at least it didn't do it on the display. I never noticed the number drop down at an accelerated rate, or certainly not one that displayed a change in the number on the screen. So I think maybe the engine management of this car, or the, sorry, the efficiency management, and the temperature management, things like that, they're really finely polished and really finely tuned. And this kind of leads me on to the next question, which is, 
what would this car be like against the MG ZS EV? Now, I think because Hyundai, they're still fairly new, aren't they, at battling it out with, say, the German brands. But I would say they're established enough now that we know we can trust the engineering, we can trust the quality. This car comes with an eight year or 100,000 mile warranty for its battery. So you've got quite a few years in, in the battery tank, if you will, uh, to know that this car probably is, is pretty reliable and is gonna be headache free to run. And the build quality in the interior, while there are some hard touch plastics, while I don't have soft touch materials in my immediate reach, Everything feels really tough, really well put together. There's no noises, no creaks, no rattles, despite the fact that there's very little powertrain noise and not too much road noise either. It's a really comfortable, very nice car to drive. Steers nicely. I like that there's a bit of roll in it, actually. It's, it feels, it doesn't at all feel like it's trying to be a sporty SUV. It is, it is entirely a comfortable and very relaxed car to drive. And I actually really like the way you can one pedal drive it as I'm demonstrating here as I come out of this junction with my paddles here behind the steering wheel. Again, not something particularly unique on a car, but the system on this car I do really like. As you click the right paddle here, you, you have three settings and it brings the car back. So now I've come off the power and the car is coasting as if it's a typical automatic. Whereas if I pull the left paddle, I increase the regenerative technology's resistance, which means I'm the technology is capturing more kinetic energy and putting more energy back into the battery but obviously it also means that there's more resistance so when i come off the power for those unfamiliar with one pedal driving it means i basically don't have to touch the brakes unless i need to do something close to an emergency stop it's very useful it's nice and easy to use and i just think you as soon as you try the one pedal driving style i think very few people would go back to having the more conventional automatic feeling in a car like this and i did actually notice that when i was coasting down a hill i gained a mile so the the readout i was coasting down a hill for what felt like 15 seconds and it added a mile to the digital display so it makes you feel good as well that you're using it you feel like you're being really efficient and this car just makes you drive smoothly and more efficiently it just means that the car's more comfortable, easier to drive, a nicer place to be for long periods of time. Is it interesting and exciting like some electric, electric cars are because they're quite quick? Well, 9.7 seconds to 60 miles per hour. I've put my foot down. I've actually got wheel spin there. It's, it's nippy. It's not shoving my head back into the headrest. Certainly quicker, as I said earlier, than the average cars. It steers nicely. I like that there's a little bit of roll because it just means you actually feel the car while there's not tons of steering feel there's a little bit of occasional vibration through the steering when you start to get to the edge of adhesion on the road which is actually quite handy i can feel when the front tires are just starting to scrub a little um which they have done because it's so cold today and i'm on a roundabout here if i put my foot down on the exit of the roundabout yeah i can feel through the steering column just a slight vibration and that that's a signal along with the fact that i see the hedgerows coming closer that the front of the car is just starting to be at the limit of its grip and I adjust my driving style accordingly, come a bit off of the power. It means you can be, again, a better driver. We're coming up to some corners now where I've driven sporty cars and really felt how bumpy and rough this road is. But while I am aware of the bumps, it's impossible to iron out some of the imperfections here. It rides nice, it rides good and it steers crucially and the most importantly for me, it steers really nicely. And I just, I just think it feels nicely judged it's the same infotainment system you get in all the latest Hyundai's, which is to say that it's good. It's nicely laid out, the graphics are clear, it's easy to use, it's not the sharpest, it's not the fastest to respond. It does have a nice layout, I think the screens are really easy to use, you get Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, all of those things as standard, and of course the digital instrument cluster that's ahead of the steering wheel here. It's sharp and you can change the dials and customise stuff a little bit, not enormously. An interesting thing I've noticed is that when I'm coasting at about 20 miles per hour with my accelerator pressed, pressed very lightly, the car seems to enter a state where it's not actually using energy and it's not using any energy or charging. It's just in this state of equilibrium, which I find really strange. So here we're doing it now. So we're actually doing, okay, admittedly, it's a little bit slow. It's 10 miles per hour. But if I cruise at 10 miles per hour, according to the dial, I'm not using any energy. So could I drive forever at 10 miles per hour? I don't know, it'd be a bit of a boring, boring year or two, but I, it certainly suggests you're using such a minimal amount of power and that maybe there is some regen happening at that speed as well. 
car. If you only can access this car, the 180 mile claimed range car, there's nothing other than that range that I can see that puts this car in a position where you don't think it's great value for money. It's not always just about that, is it? Can this car be used to carry the family around and is it easy to charge and does the boot carry your weekly shop? Can you get your suitcases in the back? And Lily, there's a charging station down the road. We're gonna head over there and put all of those questions to the test. Right, so before we talk about the ins and outs of the interior's practicality, I need to charge this thing up. So uh, handily, we've come up next to these fast chargers. So I'm just gonna plug it in. So while this service station supercharger can charge cars at up to 350 kilowatts, our little Hyundai Kona Electric, because it's the base specification model, only charges at 50 kilowatts. That means it can go from 0 to 80% in about 50 minutes, according to the manufacturer. However, it's currently charging at about 35 kilowatts, which means from the 30% it was at, it's gonna take about 40 minutes to get to 80%. So it's not rapid charging, not by any standards, but it means I've got enough time for a coffee break and some food as well. Nevertheless, it is charging. So we've got a bit of time now to walk around and see what the inside of this car is like in terms of practicality. So in the back, you'll notice there are cables in here. Obviously the charger here comes with its own cables, but if you arrive at a plug, and you need to bring your own. Hyundai does supply you with that. However, while it comes in this lovely little fashionable bag, it does not have a place to sit in the boot, or at least there's no designated storage area. You just get these two Velcro strips and you're supposed to just throw it down here. It's not massive, of course, so you could tuck it up against here, but it's not ideal. Underneath, down here, you've got a storage tray. So I guess if you wanted to put some bits and bobs in there, that's great. But if you didn't, it takes up quite a lot of room. And underneath, you have the three pin domestic plug, which obviously you plug into your house should you not have a wall plug charger. If you do have a wall plug charger, by the way, you can get seven kilowatts of power and charge the car in about six hours. So it's an overnight charger, which isn't too bad. Boot space is slightly smaller overall due to having all that bits in there, all those bits in there, but you still get 332 litres of space, which if that means nothing to you, handily, we have our trusty suitcases with us to demonstrate the room you have. I'm imagining you'd have to take this out first if you were going on your family getaway. You'd throw this in, definitely take off the parcel shelf. And then it's a bit of Tetris really, isn't it? From here on. And there's a little bit of space for your charger there. And I suppose you could probably leave this at home in the garage or throw it in on top here if you wish. Let's leave it in the garage for this time. So yeah, there's still a good amount of space in there. It's not class leading, but I think for most people, that's plenty of room. Let's take a look at the back seats. Now, if you watched our video that went out recently of the Kona N, you'll think this looks quite familiar because, well, it is very familiar. Obviously, you've got the same layout of back bench and obviously the same general back of the seat, although it's not sporty this time. However, the difference between this electric model and the petrol models is that the floor is slightly raised because you have batteries in the floor. So it does mean that while I've got good knee room here, this seat is set as I would like it in the passenger side. It means I've got good knee room in the back, but my foot room is actually a little bit more snug. I can still get my feet under, but if I had larger feet or I was wearing boots, for example, I would struggle to get them in there little bit snugger. You also don't get any vent controls in this base model and of course you've got cloth seats but you still got things like this armrest and cup holders in there and it is a proper five seater. Decent space, decent headroom. I feel very comfortable here so no major complaints but of course you are not getting the highest trimmings that you would on higher grade models. This is of course an entry-level electric car. So yeah I think that's the inside covered. Better get back out. So while this Kona Electric hasn't exactly blown my socks off today with excitement, it's been brilliantly dependable. Today has been freezing below zero degrees, yet the digital display, the miles left in the battery have been super accurate, even when I had the heating turned up to maximum. So really, as a budget offering in the electric car world, I can't complain one bit. I think it's great value for money. Of course, it's charging up now, which gives me a chance to charge up. I'm about to go and get my coffee. But before I do, of course, if you like this video, don't forget to click that little thumbs up button and of course, subscribe and click the notification button if you want to see more content like this. We have so much coming up in the next few weeks. 